Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is winning the logistics talent war with my friend, Charlie Safro. How's it going, Charlie? It is going great, Joe. I'm happy to be here having this conversation with you. I'm excited to talk to you. Guys, stick around because we're going to talk about logistics talent. There's so many changes, and I think some of them are a little counterintuitive. We have so many, we we hear a lot of doom and gloom, but that is not necessarily all what Charlie, who is the expert, sees in this world, and I'm looking forward to hearing from her. So Charlie, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Sure. So my name's Charlie Safro. I am the president and founder of a company called CS Recruiting. We are out of the Chicago area, which is where I live. And we are a third-party recruiting firm that focuses exclusively in supply chain logistics and transportation. We work all over the country helping our clients find the right talent. Our clients are 3PLs, asset providers, manufacturers and distributors, technology companies, consulting firms. Really, the common denominator is the position. And if the position has influence on the supply chain, it's a role that is usually in our wheelhouse. So we have been playing in this industry over 12 years. We have a team of 40 and we love it. Couldn't imagine doing anything else. Excellent. Excellent. So Charlie, before we hit record, we were blathering on probably too long. I hope we don't go over your time. <laughs> but, okay. but we had also talked to, oh God, probably a month ago. And yeah, we covered so much ground. And so one of the things I wanted to make sure I asked, because I know I asked you this last time we talked, I've talked to you a few times over the years, is Charlie your given name or is that a nickname? It is my given name and you are not the first person to ask that. I I probably get five emails a week addressed to Mr. Safro, and so I've <laughs> definitely gotten used to it, but it was my grandfather's name. My parents were, I guess, hippies. I was born in the late 70s and Now it's a very common name for a girl, but growing up, I was the only Charlie and everyone (laughs) mistook me for a man. So if anything, it's unique and people remember me. So I've embraced that. Yeah. I think when I met you, you were still working with your husband and I think you, his name is, is it Chad? Chad, exactly. And so so I wasn't sure if CS Recruiting was from your name or from his name. It's my name. I started the company, but Probably a year ago, our kids, for the first time, we have three sons, and they were like, wait, this is for your initials, not dad. So it's the dad's not working. Dad's not doing anything in this company. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. It's a stigma. But again, I think, you know, it's hopefully a pleasant surprise when people find out that I, you know, can bring some feminine energy to the conversation. Yeah. By the way, I was listening to, what was this show? How I Built This. It was the podcast. And it was, I think you were talking to Kate Spade before she unfortunately took her life. Brilliant woman. But she married David Spade's brother. But anyway, after they sold Kate Spade, Kate Spade told the story of going through probably Macy's or, you know, Nordstrom's or somewhere. And her daughter, who's like nine, goes, hey, look, this purse says Kate Spade on it. And she goes, yeah. <laughs> but not having any sense that that is our family. That it wasn't just monogrammed for her. <laughs> right, right. That's cute. Anyway, so Charlie, let's get back into what CS Recruiting does. You mentioned you work with 3PLs and you work with, that would include brokers, and then you also work with companies that own assets? We sure do. Both transportation, warehousing, international, domestic. We only place for roles in the United States, but we are working with global organizations for their local needs. So I, I, I know the story because I listened. I think you had talked to Ryan Schreiber and we published it on this podcast. I had listened. So... But tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you started CS Recruiting. Sure. So I grew up, I I was raised by two entrepreneurs. I think that's a great way to set the stage. And ironically, my grandparents were also entrepreneurs. So 
It's in my DNA. I was raised in the suburbs of Chicago. My mom worked and she was one of the few moms that did work in our community. And that's been ingrained in me. So I've always had a work ethic. Sometimes maybe, you know, I put too much pressure on myself, but when I reflect back, it's part of who I am and part of my journey. So I was a waitress when I was 13 years old. It was probably illegal, but that was my first job. And I don't think I've stopped working since then. I did some uh, time in retail. I worked at Nordstrom. I was a hostess, a bartender, a waitress at different places throughout college and high school and in even a little post-college. I went to college at University of Illinois. And ironically, I met my husband there on my first day. And we've we lived to tell the story together today. And I studied advertising and marketing. And out of college, I went into the ad agency world. Really fun business, lots of energy, great culture, but it's a grind. If you know anyone in that business, you know, there's no mercy. You could work till midnight and you still have to show up the next morning at 5 a.m. if that's when the client wants you there. So I did that until we had our first son. And at that time, I went back to my job after maternity leave and it just wasn't fulfilling me like it used to. You had different priorities. Different priorities, exactly. But I didn't want to be a full stay-at-home mom. I knew that I could give my my son and my future children a better version of me if I was working, if I had this other greater purpose that's just been part of who I am. So my husband was a freight broker out of college. He started a load board in the late 90s, way ahead of its time. And when I decided not to return to my advertising job, I asked my husband if I could come work for his newly established company. It was him and his brother. They had about eight employees. They were selling to shippers and carriers and bringing them together on this online marketplace. And they agreed to let me join their team. And very quickly, they decided to go through a large growth spurt. They had brought on a partner who had a big vision, and I fell into a recruiting role. So I kind of joined their company as a catch-all. I was going to do some marketing, some office management, right. and then there was a very, very clear need for recruiter. And I taught myself how to recruit. This is 2006. There was really no LinkedIn. It was a lot of Craigslist ads, classified ads, believe it or not. But I feel like because I learned how to recruit in that era, I had to work a lot harder. I had to really build relationships. I had to really be a detective to find people. Not to say that it's not a hard job now, just technology and these, you know, the social media communities make it easier. But I joined their team and I was there for about four years till they sold their business stayed on with the new owners, started to dabble in some project recruiting work. And all of a sudden, one day I, I took a step back and I was like, wow, I just have you know four clients. There is a very clear need for a recruiter who has this expertise in this industry. And it was that pivot point where I was like, I am either going to give this 110% or I'm going to walk away. And I decided to go for it. So that has really been my my evolution the last 12 years of running CS Recruiting. Well, and, and I, I, I know we can all just go on LinkedIn these days and uh, find recruiters, but it wasn't always that easy. I, I tell the story. When I went on LinkedIn, I feel like I was the first million people because it said, connect with your friends, your coworkers, your family, your neighbors. None of them. I, I, I didn't connect to anyone. And I loved it right away. And um, that was still pre-Facebook. I mean, it was everyone was using MySpace. And my kids were always saying, you got to use MySpace. I was like, oh, I love this. This is business oriented. But you could not easily recruit from there at that time. And no. now it feels like everybody is at my fingertips now on LinkedIn. Amazing. Yeah. And, and right now, if I wanted to, I, I used to, We've all worked with companies that overstate things, right? Say, oh, well, we're 60 million in sales. Then you go, I'm looking at your LinkedIn. There's you. That's an admin. You got four people. Nope. Exactly. <laughs> right? And so. <laughs> Nothing is crazy. <laughs> right. And by the way, if I look at CS Recruiting, you guys are killing it. So congratulations. And I came across you guys years ago. I'm one of my friends. He lives in Northbrook, right outside Chicagoland. And he said, hey, I want to introduce you to this gal. She works at a company called CS Recruiting. And she she grew up in her neighborhood. She's friends with my daughters. And I was like, I talked to her. I forgot her name now. But I remember some one of my clients said, hey, I got to replace a general manager. I said, oh, talk to this gal. <laughs> and and they filled that job. So exactly. So I was like, okay, there it is, CS Recruiting. Thank you. No, that's, that's how the business works. We've been very 
I guess we've been fortunate. We've worked very hard to build our reputation, our brand recognition, but the majority of our business has come to us through word of mouth referrals and just the industry we're in. It's very cyclical, as you can imagine. We may work with someone who's a hiring manager, have a great relationship. One day they may become a candidate when they're ready to move on. We work with them in that context, help them get a new position, and then they're our hiring manager again. So really fortunate that We've been able to work with a lot of the same people and provide a good service and continue to get referrals that that come to us inbound and just got to live up to those expectations. Yeah. And I want to talk a, a few things before we – eventually I'm going to pick your brain here about the logistics talent world, but I want to say a few things. First off, if you're not already connected to Charlie, you need to follow her on LinkedIn because – she posts some very interesting stuff. This is I'm saying this increasingly more on about LinkedIn is there's some people who are really good follows. And that means they're putting original good content out. And Charlie always does. In fact, we'll 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 lean on some of that as we get into our conversation. But I want to talk to you during the pandemic, I think, you guys switched to all remote. And then as a result, you don't have your office, but I do know you guys get together a lot. So I want you to talk about that. And then I want you to tell us about your trip, because I would have seen you at Manifest a few weeks ago, exactly. but I didn't because you guys were going on a trip and you talked to me before you went. So talk about the remote first and then talk about the nice trip that you and the CS team went on. Yeah. So, I mean, thinking back to the very beginning in 2011, I hired my first employee and it's kind of a funny story. We had, you know, I extended an offer. She accepted it. We worked at the terms. I was in Highland Park and got an office space there. She lived in the city. She was going to take a bus to a train to a bus and then walk to our office. Seems about right. <laughs> exactly. We gave her a stipend. We agreed we'd make it work. Weather's and nice right, in the winter there, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Just got to plow your way through. But right before she started, I lost my childcare on Wednesdays. And so I remember calling her up. And I mean, I can imagine she's you know hearing from her new boss. And I said, listen, I still want you to come and start. And we have this office space and we'll be together. But on Wednesdays, I won't be able to make it into the office right now. So you'll be able to work from home and we'll be together Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So it's just funny because eventually I did get childcare on Wednesdays, but we stuck to that model. It seemed to work for us that we both had that day in the middle of the week to focus, you know, on on private to be humans, <laughs> to be humans, and to, to be our introverted selves. And then that has that has stayed with us. So way before the pandemic, we were a hybrid company. Most of our team members started with one day at home. They could work up to three days at home through performance and tenure. But that's the only way we've ever known it is having that kind of dual environment. When the pandemic happened, like everyone else, we went home on March 13th of 2020. And there was just such a waste of energy talking about when we were going to return to the office. We were trying to keep up with the news. And then, you know, it was July, then it was September, then it was January. And then we sent our office manager out looking for plexiglass and how are we going to separate our desks and all, you know, all the things that just everyone was thinking of. And we finally surveyed our team and said, you know, we've been working at home a year now. How is this going for you? Do you want this to be our new normal and the future of the company? And I would say a couple people were nervous and they said, I, I think I want to do that as long as I have some touch points with my team. But we ended up buying out our lease and becoming a fully virtual company. One thing a little unique about us, and maybe we'll get over this one day, but we still very strongly prefer to hire in the state of Illinois because we do enjoy our face-to-face -to -face time together. So we do quarterly meetings. We do monthly. Means a little less once you're remote though, doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, who knows but if they're still in Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> right. At least they can get to us. But a commitment we made was to take a portion of our office rent that we were no longer paying and to take our team on a retreat every year. So we just got back from our second year in Mexico, three nights, four days as a team really was a vacation for everyone. We do it is a reward. Yeah, that wasn't to work either. That was to play. It was to play. There's no actually there were no laptops allowed. So we really position it. This is a reward for all the hard work that got us here. And it's our appreciation as a team, but it's also our opportunity to reset, refuel for the year ahead. But most of all, it's a connection point for our team. So we 
take everything else away so people can be themselves and they can get to know their colleagues behind their title. Because in the work environment, you just, you, you really form relationships based on what do you do and what do I do and how do we do this together versus who are you? What do you care about? What do you have going on behind your, you know, your title? And that's what this trip is about. So we got back last week, lots of fun, lots of connection. And I would genuinely say, I mean, our team members view each other as friends. And that is always a priority of mine. I'm not going to force friendships, but the more you appreciate, respect, and enjoy the company of your team members, the harder you're going to work, the better service you're going to provide. I mean, it's it's all part of that ROI. So I'm very committed to our culture and you know, people first, human leadership style. Yep. So have you noticed business results slipping since you went remote? No. We have not. Or you were to reopen the office. <laughs> no. You know, I would say there's a little part of me that feels selfish because I know I work best remote. It was not something I realized before the pandemic, but now that I've been doing this for three years, I know that I'm a lot more creative when I'm alone. I'm not distracted. I get better ideas in my home environment where I'm comfortable, but productivity is not dropped. In fact, we made a change about a year ago. We used to give like summer Fridays. So for those, you know, eight weeks of the summer, we would close on those eight Fridays. And we actually moved that to a year long policy because our productivity was good working from home. So not quite a four day work week yet. We call it flexible Fridays where there are no internal meetings on Fridays and everyone can count on no meetings, no deadlines. I'd say the majority of our team probably does work, but they can start at 10, they can finish at 11. As long as they hit their goals, get their work done, it's kind of like a, you're adults, we're going to give you this flexibility. And as long as you're productive, we'll, we'll leave you alone. And it's very much appreciated. Yeah. My mom, who's in her 80s now, she talks to my daughters who are in their you know, late 20s, 30s now. And it kind of blows her away. So like when my one daughter said, oh, I have unlimited vacation time. And I was like, what does that even mean? What do you mean unlimited vacation? And she said, and my son-in-law is always quick to point out, well, that's just, it's easier for the accounting. My daughter says, I have to bill for a certain amount of hours. She's a consultant. And as long as I do that, I can take days off. And she's, and, and, I'm, and my mother ran, my mom and dad owned like a dry cleaner laundromat. And I remember for a long time, if I was sick, I went to the dry cleaner laundromat. To this day, I hate that smell. And then after they sold that business, my mom uh, ran an office for like radiation on oncology, which is people who are, have cancer. And at the hospital, she'd say, that was a flexible area of the hospital because it's nine to nine to five or eight to four or whatever. But she said, you can't miss. There's a peep, this is life and death. She said, the only vacation days or, or sick, sick days she would take would be if me or my sister were sick. And I remember we run into this, and I think it's weird now. How many snow days has your kid has had this year? Zero, because now they know how to do it virtually. See, it's interesting. Here, we have a whole bunch of snow days where they close the schools. And my mom always says, they close the school, but Ford Motor Company doesn't close. General Motors doesn't close. The hospital doesn't close. They close the school. And she said, when the schools would close, you go, I get it. They don't want to run the buses, but I should at least be able to drop my kids off. Exactly. And you watch them for that. I don't care if they play dodgeball all day or watch movies. They shouldn't be at my house by, by themselves, and I don't want to take the day off. So yeah. I feel like so much of what we've done in the past, we, you can't tell me somebody's being 100% productive if they're worried about their 10-year-old leaving the stove on. Exactly. And it's it's amazing that when you give someone a set period of time and say, if you can achieve your goals by Thursday afternoon, I do not care what you do Friday. People can do it. They become more productive. They waste less time. I work late on Thursday to get Friday off. Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's they're not even getting 40 hours in 4 days a week. They are just using their time more mindfully and being more thoughtful and intentional with their work that lo and behold, it's Thursday at 4 and I just finished my week. I mean, many of our team members, they're salaried, they're also on commission. So, you know, it's it's in them to keep working Friday, knowing that sky's the limit and the more they put in, the right. more they'll get out. But it seems to really work. And it's a, it's a huge, you know, perk when we're recruiting, but it's also a great reason people stay with us. Yeah. And by the way, I, I don't think this is any secret. You have a lot of women work for you, right? 
we do. Not not intentionally. It's just kind of happened that way. So we have six men on our team right now of about 42. So it's just, it's funny. In every other, you know, in the industry we play in, women are the minority. At CS Recruiting, men are the minority. But it's just worked out. My dad used to run an engineering, owned an engineering business. And I remember my dad say, we hire, we always hire women here. And I remember it wasn't because my dad had this diversity mindset. It was because he said, the guys behave themselves and they dress better when, when you hire women. That's interesting. <laughs> that is interesting. Well, no, it's funny. A lot of people ask, like, how can you take a whole company away and put them up in a hotel and not worry? Well, two of our employees are married that they met at the office. So one of one of the men is taken by another employee and the other five all have significant others. So we're not worried oh, so about it. you guys any- are a matchmaker in addition to matchmaking jobs. You also get, oh, this is very, very Isn't handy. That great? Yeah. So I want to touch on a few things. So we talked before we hit record, we were talking about the, the 40-hour work week, which CS Recruiting is saying, I don't care when you do those 40 hours. I don't care if, it, I don't care if you did it 35 hours. Just get the work done. So I want to talk a little bit about that, but I want, also want to talk about there was something trending on LinkedIn the other day, and it was this idea of the 60-year career. And I was like, 60-year career. And that means you start at 22 and you stop at 82. What that means, and I don't think that means you're going all out when you're 82. I know I know all of our congressmen and senators who are in their 80s. They are not working their asses off. <laughs> they have huge teams that do the work and prop them up like weekend at Bernie's. But we'll touch on those 40-hour work week, but also on the 60-year career. And again, that seems very long, but I'm, I'm like 40-some years in myself, so I don't feel like quitting, and no one's going to fire me here. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway... A few weeks, uh, probably a month ago, you had posted something on LinkedIn, and I want to go through some of that. And it was, I'll start it off here. It was some bullet points you posted. And again, guys, check out Charlie's LinkedIn. She is a great follow. There were some points here, and it was the first thing I says is more job offers rejected than we've ever seen in a month and, and what this means. So what does that mean? Is that, by the way, is that still the case? It's a month old. So that was December, but I would say the good news is it slowed down, but our business is on such a lag. If you think of, you know, the process, yes. six days or so to find someone and then they start and then they have to, you know, get into the environment and start working. But a rejected offer is, you know, here's an offer. We'd like to join your team or join our team. And then that person declines. It's rejected so- tender in some people's business. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And there's there's different reasons for it. I mean, usually it's they have another offer and it could be with another company, a competitor, something totally different, or it could be a counter offer. And usually that counter offer isn't presented until they go to resign. So in many ways, they accept an offer and then change their mind with that counter. Usually they don't last much more than six months if they accept a counter because the company is the same company just with a, a Band-Aid on it now with maybe more money. But And then people also get cold feet. I would say a few of those rejected offers were just simply low balls where you know our client put an offer out there, the candidate ended up staying where they were at. But what that tells us is that candidates were still in control at that point. That's really what the recruiting market is about. It's it's always looking at who's in the driver's seat. And over the course of a year, it changes. And it's just like- Who's in control now in February 15th? So right now, companies are in control, and that's really apparent from all these layoffs that we've seen, that there are now more unemployed people than there are jobs. What's really interesting is this trend that our team has been kind of honing in on in the last month that we are hearing from more employed candidates than ever. So these are not candidates that were laid off and now they're unemployed and calling us. These are people that maybe the layoff put a little fear in them. Maybe the layoffs made them think about, is this what I really want to be doing? But we probably have the best talent pool we've ever had of employed passive talent right now. So that's interesting. That does not tell me that companies are in the driver's seat. So maybe we're preparing for another shift in the market. But when there are mass layoffs, I mean, you you really have to look at that imbalance. And now there's a lot more people that are unemployed. Not so much in our industry. I'm very grateful that we seem to have some stability. There have been layoffs. There have been you know, performance eliminations, but not feeling it like we're seeing it in the tech industry. 
Yeah, and I'm not usually a dishonest person, but when you talk to recruiters, yeah, or prospective employers, yeah, you 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 exaggerate or or lie. If if I was looking for a job right now, I would not say I'm unemployed. So you have some of those that I I don't know how to you easily find out that they that they're lying to you. <laughs> Oh, we well, sure you're women. Do. You're women, so you kind of go mostly women. You go, yeah, that dude's lying. I know. <laughs> we have a funny view of the industry because you know, if you think of it, let's say there's a company that their employees don't know, but they're preparing for an acquisition. We'll get a call from an employee, and they may be a dispatcher or a carrier rep, and they're like, something's off in my work environment. Like I keep seeing men in suits walking around, and I think I should be looking. And then an hour later, we get a call from another person at that company, and they've observed something different, but they're also getting cold feet. And then at the end of the day, we've now talked to 10 people from that company. And so we almost, I don't want to say that we can predict the future, but when we all put our comments together, we're like, something's going on. And then the next day, the news breaks that that company was sold, or they cut their commission, or you know they're changing ownership. So we definitely get in front of some of these trends, or at least we can pick up on them very quickly. Just that's the nature of our business. And you know we kind of put the puzzle pieces together to figure out what's going on today and and what should we expect tomorrow? Yep. Yep. So you had a thing here on your notes, this going back about a month that said, despite their layoffs, there is still a high demand for niche niche or niche talent. What are that? What is that niche or niche talent that is still in high demand? So I don't think there's been a day in 12 years where we have not had multiple carrier and customer roles open. Those are constant Every 3PL out there wants salespeople on either side of the desk. If you can bring me someone with a book of business who's ready to hit the ground, no non-compete, there are not many people that have that criteria, but those are constant positions. I would say this niche talent is when a company knows they either do not have the person in the company now to look at promoting and they don't have the network beyond the company to really go out and find the best person for the role could be, you know, often their leadership roles, there's more priority and emphasis when you're looking at manager, director, VP and above. But in the brokerage market, we're also seeing a lot of really specialized positions based around modes or different service offerings. So really wanting someone who is an LTL pricing analyst or someone who can really manage strategic accounts for managed transportation, not spot market brokerage. And a lot of that is, you know, it comes from the perception of the, the competitive market. So we want to hire a pricing analyst from a competitor who's doing it there and can come do it here. But we are seeing this shift and it's really becoming more about skills, which is, it's a great thing. And it's really in every industry, a lot of companies are kind of taking that step back and saying, it's not as much the experience, the background, where they worked, when they worked there. It's what do they bring to us today and moving forward? And those are skills, hard and soft skills. But Soft skills are starting to really take the lead in terms of criteria, which is a good thing. Yep. You mentioned employers say, hey, I want somebody, I want a sales guy or sales sales gal, and I want them to have a, a book of business and no non-compete. And I want to separate those two for just a second. So there's been a lot of discussion about non-compete. So I want you to talk a little bit about the non-competes. But from my perspective, if let's just say I worked at CS Recruiting today and I said, I would like to leave here. And I'm assuming you have no non-compete. I can go start my own recruiting company. But I don't think I can call on all of the – take your CRM and say it's now my new company CRM. So I think – I always hear people say to me, hey, Joe, could you uh, recommend someone who has a good book of business and can bring it to us? And I was like, I don't even think that's particularly – I don't know if it's legal, but it's not moral for one – you should be able to quit a job and start another job and call on people. But the idea that I somehow just took my whole book of business and maybe took stuff that's proprietary to my employer, that's not right or fair. Nor is saying you can never work in this business again because you worked for us for two years. So speak to both of those things. Yeah, two different 
things. Sometimes there are two clauses in the same agreement, but I mean, to break it down, these are employment agreements. It's very natural and normal and fair for an employee to sign an employment agreement when they join a company. It will cover, you know, conduct, policies, confidentiality. If you are coming here and we're teaching you, you can't take this with you. The, there are non-competes and non-solicits, and there are a lot of employment agreements that have both. The non-compete restricts them from working in a competitive landscape. Companies handle this different ways. So some companies will literally list out what that means. A competitor could be a brokerage. It could be a carrier. It could be a technology company. It could be a TMS. It could be a shipper. And really limits what that employee is able to do with their career. Some companies will list out, you can't go work for these 20 companies, but if you go somewhere else, that's fine. But the non-compete is what we're really pushing to move away from. It's it's just- They don't, they don't particularly do well in the courts of law either. No, no. And it's really what it comes down to is the company that enforces it usually has more money than the individual. And it's a scare tactic and they've got counsel. And does this individual have- Thirty, forty thousand dollars to fight this in hopes that they win, and it usually ends in them backing off because they're scared. The non-solicit is very fair and reasonable, and if that, you know, if the non-competes go away, the non-solicits may very well stay, and people will still be able to thrive in their careers. Non-solicit is just saying the relationships that you secured while you worked for us, you cannot take with you until you've been gone for a year, sometimes gone for two years. Those include colleagues, those include partnerships, and most importantly, customers and often carriers. And that's where the skills-based hiring comes into play. Because if you are looking for someone with a book of business, you're really looking for someone who knows how to build relationships, that understands strategic selling, that's passionate about that you know, hustle. They don't need their book to do that. They can rebuild a book just like they did in their last job. And so that's where we're hoping to see more in the future that companies are focused on I want a great salesperson. I don't expect them to have loads on the board day one, but I believe in the skill set we're hiring and our ability to support them and train them that at the end of you know six months or whatever it is, they are going to be a very valuable employee. Right. You know, today, if we, you and I were to start a, a freight broker 3PL right now, and we said we're going to go into business, I would say, let's build our company in a way that you can't easily take business with you. And what that means to me, and again, I'm, this is just my opinion, we have the cradle to grave model when we talk about freight brokerage where I sold that account and then I managed those shipments right on through from from the time they the initial phone call through all the tracking, tracing, all that. And if I do really well, I get some assistance to work for me and I get a piece yeah. of what, they, what all of those go through me, right? That's the cradle to grave. I, and I think there's now what we've called also maybe the Chicago model, which is we're going to have a lead generation people. We're going to have prospecting people. We're going to have account management or customer service people. We're going to have a, maybe a billing expert. So there's a whole team that is touching that customer on a regular basis, including the salespeople. And to me, that's a lot harder to take away that business when, you, when somebody should leave. We say, okay, Charlie left. Oh, well, I really like Charlie, but that's all right. I'm still working with these other three or four people. Exactly. And that's a company's goal is that it's their values, their systems, their processes, most importantly, their people, but those people will rotate through the company and it's up to that company to make them believe in the purpose and embrace their values to represent. So yeah, it's, it, it, it's very fair to have a non-solicit and I would think that those will continue on, but let's hope that the FDA bans the non-compete portion just for fairness. Right. And so there is, obviously, if you go on LinkedIn, there's a huge amount of uh, logistics companies that put their logo on that non-compete. I don't know what, I think it was it's Steam, Steam logistics. logistics. They were pushing this, but there's dozens and dozens of, I think, including you guys saying, let's end non-competes. But you're not saying let's end non-solicits because you feel like that's that's fair. Exactly. I paid exactly. you. I paid you to develop those relationships here. It is unfair to say, and, and I've I've heard these conversations before, where it's like, well, this we got him right out of school. We trained him. Everything he knows about logistics and supply chain is from us. Now he's not allowed to go work for our competitor. I'm like, 
Yeah, he is. That's part of what that was part of his compensation or part of her compensation is that they learned at our company. Exactly. Different than the non solicit. <laughs> and it's up to I mean, people leave companies every day and there's a variety of reasons and variables, but it's up to that company to retain their people. And what's really interesting when you think about it is whatever strategies and tactics they use to retain, it's also a recruiting strategy and tactic. So all the things we've talked about today, you know, we have a flexible work from home policy. We have our Fridays option. It would be hard to quit there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's hard to quit, but it also is really, you know, attracting people who are in opposite situations. Not to say that every company needs to do that, but you really have to play off the pain points of the candidate and offer them what you have. But it's up to these these leaders. This is all part of culture and retention and recruiting. It, it's the same thing. You're trying to, you know, really take care of the people that are representing you. You want to get them in and then you want to keep them. So it's all part of the same cycle. And I won't mention any names, but we were talking about this before we hit record is you know, I think the management has changed so significantly in my lifetime. So when I first started working, I'm aging myself, but when I first started working, a lot of my bosses had fought in World War II and they had organized business as this top down, I'm the boss and you do what you're told. And we weren't even particularly process oriented then. Where it was just like the boss knows what to do and none of the rest of us don't. We just follow directions. And I always had white collar jobs. So I was an engineer. I was I was in product development. So but that was very much the mindset. And then for a long time after that, I worked for the guys who fought in Korea. Not very different perspective. And so I'm a baby boomer, one of the last of the baby boomers, the youngest, I should say. When we hit the workforce, by the way, we were the super entitled, ridiculously low work ethic people before the Gen X and millennials. <laughs> so it, it's not uncommon. you know. So we hear about it more and more, like the baby boomers are all saying it. We were called that, except it was even worse because we had long hair and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you wouldn't know it. <laughs> but things have changed so significantly. But I was saying before we hit record, a friend of mine just joined a company, and we won't mention names, and he had called me and said, should I go there? And I said, yes, 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 definitely go there. And he said, I like it that they have a female CEO there. And I was thinking, yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean because it is a different leadership style. And I'm not saying male leadership style was in any way wrong. It's just we never saw that. I didn't see that early in my career, but I worked in a motive where it was always a lot of female bosses over time. But it's interesting yeah. because I think when you're coming at, at this as a mom, you're saying, I get it. And I, I, you probably get it more than any guy because like it or not, women do seem to take more of a role in nurturing the family. And so you kind of go, hey, I get where these young ladies and uh, most are, are coming from. If you're a parent, and let's face it, a lot of people in the workforce and a lot of very productive people in the workforce happen to be with kids. Yeah. It's it, it's definitely a skill set that I think any parent starts to really grasp the, the day you become a parent. You've got to learn how to multitask. You've got to solve problems. You've got to be, you know, constantly worrying and taking care of holding yourself accountable for someone else's life. But what I've realized about being a woman in this industry specifically is for many years I was scared to show my emotions. I was, you know, in conversations with men, definitely outnumbered by men. And so I kind of just adapted to their style and kept my emotions to myself. And in the past couple of years, I've really started to embrace that empathy and compassion are emotions that belong in the workplace. And if I put my people first and I can understand how they're feeling and, you know, put myself in their shoes, I'm going to be able to take better care of them, help them develop into stronger employees. And in return, our service is going to be better. And that's what I've really embraced in the past, I'd say three or four years, that empathy belongs in the workplace. And it's probably the strongest skill a leader brings. I care about every person on my team and the job they're doing. And of course, we're running a business. So it is about you know how well they can manage the responsibilities of their role. 
But at the end of the day, they are humans. And there's a lot that goes into being a human. There's emotions, there's feelings, there's different, you know, backgrounds and points of view. And so I think that's the big difference between men and women is I'm now at a point in my career where, you know, if a, a man or a woman wants to come and bully me over, you know, a contract, I kind of kill him with kindness. Like that is who I always have been, but I, I, I hit it for many still years. Kill him. I still kill him, exactly. <laughs> They're going to think I'm weak and walk all over me where the reaction is actually different. The minute I open that up and I may ask someone like, well, how do you feel? They're so caught off guard that I even care about them. And I think that's a big, a big trend and something that hopefully the pandemic started it, but it is something that companies are embracing. Well, I think one of the things also is I mentioned I'm a baby boomer and I think we hit an inflection point where there's more baby boomers who are past retirement age, which I think is significant because Gen X is, I think, 400,000 fewer people. And our economy is always growing, not as quickly as we'd like it, but it's always growing. So to have fewer people is is kind of a shock to the system. So people who are younger than the baby boomers are in a position to say, I want, I want life. And I'm not going to sacrifice. By the way, as a baby boomer, we were a massive influx into the economy when we hit. And we all had to compete. And if the boss didn't go home till seven o'clock, we were all sitting around waiting for the boss to go home so we could all go home after him or her, right? This is just so everything's changing. I think there's a recognition that if we treat people better, that, that they're going to stay longer and hopefully be more productive, but they have to be more productive. But um, I think this remote work came, maybe that's the silver lining, COVID. I think also in COVID, you started to realize, yeah, we have co-workers and employees who have issues at home, maybe a sick loved one, maybe, you know, maybe somebody lost a job. We're all in this together. And I think that more, you know, that the, 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 the line between work and home blurred because I could see your kids in their pajamas in the background. <laughs> A real interesting time right now. I mean, we have four generations in the workforce, which is unique. And if you think about this youngest generation of workers, these Gen Zs, they're 28 years old. So there are a lot of them in the workforce and a lot of them in management and starting to move into leadership roles. But mathematically, that is the next population that will take over this workforce. So it's just kind of like bookends right now. And I think it's a lot about educating each other, understanding each other, and really looking at that common denominator of it's not about a generation and them being entitled or them being greedy. It's about what is the best thing to do for everyone that we will do the right thing for the company and please everyone. So we used to think they were really entitled and greedy. And the truth is they wanted what but that was wants. that Again, I heard the same thing when I was young, when I first started work. We were the, we were, the, and by the way, I also remember so vividly, we had wore sh shirts and ties. And I remember we would have casual, we'd go casual on Saturdays. And yes, we worked on Saturdays. And we thought that was such a cool thing that we can come in on Saturdays casual. <laughs> but it's it's all changed so much, and but it's changed for the better, I think. And I will say this, the 40-hour work week, we talked about this before we hit record, I think it's going to come under attack because there's going to be people my age and older who are going to say, you know what, I want to work. I don't want to sit and watch game shows all day. I got nothing else to do. I don't want to volunteer anywhere. I want to continue working. Maybe I need to continue working. But I don't want to work 60 hours. I don't even want to work 40 hours. Can you fit me in in a 25, 30-hour work week? And I think, I think we're going to need to accommodate those people. And I will also say, I think we're going to find that there's going to be parents who say, you know, me and my wife would both like to work 25 hours a week and be with our kids. And we can, on our income, we can afford that. It's going to be interesting. I mean, there's definitely, you know, job sharing, not something we've ever explored, but like I said before, I mean, it's still a full-time job with full-time pay. It's just when you look at it as I can get Friday off if I really manage my time Monday through Thursday, people operate differently. So I, I totally agree that, like, I mean, the pandemic got us all thinking about our priorities and gave us a lot more empathy for each other and what we were all going through together. That there's just been, I mean, one thing we did coming out of the pandemic was in addition to our 
paid holidays and vacation time, we created caregiver days. And all of our employees get three caregiver days because we know that in the course of a year, a kid is gonna get sick, a dog is gonna have to go to a vet, a grandma is gonna need you to help them. So that was just one little change, but very appreciated by our team. Yep, I saw something, a video yesterday on YouTube, and it was somebody talking about remote work seems like just a, a huge, huge coup for workers, right? We can all work remote. I heard a guy say, he goes, but don't get too carried away. He says, because remote work also opens the door that that job doesn't have to go to an American. So you're making, you know, $200,000 a year. I found somebody who'll do it for 65 and they speak English. And that's the whole, you know, nearshore, offshore staffing market that's taking off, rightfully so. My my podcast, I've said this many times, my podcast is produced and edited by Natalie and Natalie lives in Columbia. And she is fantastic. And my, our friends over at Lean Solutions Group, they I think they have 9,000 people in Colombia. And it starts off as we save money by doing some work in Colombia. But what ends up happening over the years is a skill set develops in that community. And all of a sudden, we're going to see businesses bloom out of that, that area. It starts off as, aren't we great for saving money? And then you say, hey, we're going to create some uh, another area that we potentially compete against. So the world is changing, so it's not, it's not all good news. When you go remote, you still got to do the job. Otherwise, you're going to be replaced by somebody who does. It is so true. And remote is, it's a lot of work for all parties. I wouldn't say it's easier or harder, but you don't just snap your fingers and make it work the job overnight. never The job never ends when you're remote because you go, wasn't it great? I ran over and got to my grocery shopping at noon. This is so great. Well, at 8 p.m. when you're still doing your work, you're like, I used to go home at the end of the day. <laughs> It's really wild when I think back to my very first two jobs. Like I had a desktop computer. So if I wasn't at my desk in my office, I wasn't working. And it's a blessing and a curse that we're all on laptops and so digitally connected. As a business owner, I love it because I enjoy my work and I want to stay connected. But it can definitely lead to burnout and stress and, you know, anxiety because the expectations. But again, it you know, we have a, a rule in our office, in our team, no emails after 6 p.m., no internal emails and no emails between Friday at 6 and Monday morning. And it's just a simple rule. Like, I don't care if you're working, but schedule, send them or put them in your drafts. Don't burden someone else because you chose to work at midnight, because we all know that feeling when you open your email and you have an after hours note and you feel like you just need to respond right away. I used to feel like when my boss sent a note, I had to respond to it then period and then you just created then they're going to respond and then you're going to respond again and now your five minute response is five hours later yeah. you're deep in the work yeah so. i'm superhuman i don't have to worry about it so exactly. i want to talk to you about a few other things here so i'm going to read just so it says again this is from january it said more job offers were rejected than we've ever seen before this means despite the layoffs there's still high demand for niche talent not all talent this has changed a little bit. And then it says candidates are receiving multiple offers. But you said it switched a little bit back to the, because of layoffs, there seems to be the um, the strength goes to the uh, employers. Candidates are exploring new opportunities, but changing their minds re after receiving offers. But you had something else here. I want to say employers were refining search rates based on economic conditions, which means more searches were closed due to hiring freezes and budget cuts. So that was something you saw in December. Is that still happening? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had a lot of clients that are either putting their searches on hold or revisiting them because they need time or need to, you know, just a revenue issue or a, a credit issue. So we're seeing that it's starting to come back to life, but it's just a reflection. Like when you think of if all these companies are laying people off, there is something, you know, something going on that's bigger than this. Yep. I want to throw something out there, and this is kind of my own perspective, of course. I feel like we're seeing so much technology come in the freight brokerage space, and we're seeing you know leaders like Uber and Convoy and LoadSmart and Transfix. Those are the kind of the newer guys. But then we also have companies like C.H. Robinson spent, you know, not just them. A lot of the incumbents have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on technology. We see, what, 20,000 freight brokerages out there, which is an increase. And I've heard as much as 22,000. And some of those are just trucking companies that said, well, out of brokerage. But I see over time, 
I think over time we'll see fewer freight brokers in numbers and in also in those companies. I think we're going to see more technology give the upper hand to the, the companies that have invested in that technology. So right now, if I'm a t- one of those tech-centric companies, my cost of transactions are just lower than the other guys. So yeah. do you see that? Do you see? I, I know you're probably not seeing it yet, but my sense is that if I'm a freight broker. I need to start thinking of myself a little broader rather than say I get trucks for cold chain. I need to say I need to go work at a cold chain warehouse or become a purchasing guy for a food company and start having a career that is more applied to the supply chain rather than what is just a very small piece. Never forget, guys, transportation is the tail. The dog is the supply chain. Right. That's a great way to put it. You got to First, procure the materials. You got to produce it. You got to distribute it. So I see that I believe we're going to see fewer freight brokers. I don't think we'll have the same need because technology is going to do more and more of that work. I can see more of those guys becoming data scientists and other roles, but I can also see, again, the job I did for many years early in my career no longer exists in any significant way. And it was because I was a designer on the board, drafting board. Drafting boards went to CAD systems. And the CAD systems became so good that there was just – and by the way, we got paid a ton of money. I remember I got promoted to engineer, and all my team teased me because they thought I had to take a big pay cut to do it. I didn't. Thank you very much. But that was – CAD – people who worked on those CAD systems got paid a fortune. And the technology has advanced to the point where we don't need as many people doing it. I mean, that is the business we're in, especially going back to our conversation with non-competes, is helping individuals in this industry realize their full potential. So you were a freight broker or a dispatcher. That does not have to be the only path you stay in. And we help them understand these are the skills. These are the, the relationships you've built. These are all the other things that you can do with your career. And a lot of it is natural to go to the shipper side and be a load planner or get involved in procurement or, you know, Run a warehouse. Yeah. Warehouse. Exactly. And so learn, I think that's why the tech. <laughs> yeah. And they'll come to us saying, I, I like being a freight broker, but I don't aspire to be a freight broker manager. So what else can I do? And that's where, because we focus on the entire industry, we can really help these individuals evaluate the right path. As it relates to technology, as much as, you know, the role you were in does not exist anymore, there are so many roles that are going to surface in the future that we can't even believe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if I would have told you 10 years ago, you know, you might, you're going to know 10 people that are social media managers, you would have been like, what's social media, you know? And so what the way I like to think about it, and I saw a post yesterday, I think it was Chad Olson who posted this, and it was technology is not going to replace people. It is going to make people more efficient. It is going to make processes more streamlined and seamless, less errors, more on-time deliveries. And I think that's the way to think about it is if the freight is there, you may be able to move, you know, historically 10 loads a day as a carrier rep. And now with this technology, you're moving 30 loads a day. And as long as the freight funnel is there, we're all doing more, making more money, and then that overflow will move into the newly created positions. Right. And, you know, but it does, in my mind, require some planning. Because, again, I'm one of my buddies, worked Chicago Board of Options there in Chicago, open outcry. So I mean, he would work in those pits, you know, where he's sell, sell, buy, buy, buy. And I remember I used to always say, isn't your job going to be done by a computer? And he's like, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. His, job, his job's done by a computer. He doesn't do that job anymore. Yeah, and, he's not in, and not in that industry anymore. And by the way, I bump into guys that I used to work with on these CAD systems, get paid a ton, who are no longer in professional careers, let me put it that way. So it does require you to think about what else should I be doing? Because I, my, my, I say this all the time. If I'm a freight broker, I'm becoming an expert in something. Maybe it's an expert in cold chain or in retail. It's it's better to sell that way. But I think that way all the time is pick a supply chain because warehouses are going to become segmented by we are an e-commerce warehouse or we are a cold chain warehouse or we're this kind of. And I think we're going to see the segmentation in our space. So pick a supply chain and become that flat out expert, not just for the truck, but from order to cash. Exactly. And it makes you just more well-rounded yes. and diversified. 
right and interesting and, and a more interesting career more if you valuable can. valuable too. <laughs> yeah, so it's in different sides of the desk. So I want to wrap this bad boy up. Thank you so much for talking, Charlie. So first off, I want to ask you, who else should I have on my podcast? I like smart people like you. So who else should I have on my podcast? Well, I will lean into more women because I think that we all know we need more women in this industry. And the best way to attract them is to share stories and help other women be on the logistics of logistics. That's the best. That's the biggest exactly. incentive that's, in the whole business. <laughs> there you go. And so I, I work with and respect a lot of women. I would say, I don't know if you know Kara Smith Brown. She owns a company called Lead Coverage. She was one of the originals at Echo. Okay. She's in Atlanta and she had a long career in brokerage before she just started to leverage her marketing mind. And she is an absolute genius when it comes to. Getting building leads. your brand. <laughs> exactly creating leads is that a big thing in this business is people want leads starting to be and so she, she started this company well yes everyone wants leads but is there a marketing budget and that is what we're starting to see is more companies that have an investment to I would love to talk to her Kara Smith Brown from Lead Coverage I will reach out and maybe you'll have to introduce me but I would be happy to she's got a lot to share so final thoughts on this topic before we wrap this up? Well, there's a lot of thoughts. I mean, I would say my advice if you're an employee or a potential job seeker is post pandemic, we're living in a different world and you need to understand your needs and your wants and go after what you need. You need a salary, you need a job, you may need benefits, but what you want is out there and you may have to look for it. You may have to network for it. You may want flexibility. You may want, you know, trips to Mexico, whatever it is, companies are yes, really yes, stepping please. up. <laughs> exactly. And on the employer side, my advice is let's focus on our people. Yes, there's so much more that goes into making a business, but nothing is going to exist without people. Even a technologically driven service organization still has people behind it. And I want to see more leaders focused on retaining their people because when you retain people and you do the right things and the right level of, you know, seeing them and hearing them, you're naturally attracting you're taking them to Mexico. Exactly. Exactly. It'd be a great thing if one day people didn't need recruiters because they just have employees flocking to their company because they are such a great organization. So not to cannibalize my business, I've got other things I can consult on, but Really, that's what a lot of our work is, is just marketing an opportunity to the right person at the right time. The world the world has changed a lot in the last you know 20 years, but it's going to change even more as we deal with the fact that we have fewer people in the workforce. So we're going to, we already have a labor shortage in certain areas. And, and I think we're going to have to figure out how to become better employers. And I think the employees are going to have to figure out how do I, how do I navigate a career in a time where things are going to change? You know, Things didn't change as rapidly pre-technology. So you didn't find yourself displaced like I was doing this job for five years, then it just kind of went away. But we seem to see that now. It's not too hard to imagine a future where a lot of the things we do now is done by AI or some other crazy tech. It's happening. So what I'll do is I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile and I'll put a link to CS Recruiting and any other links you want to give me. But before you go, who's your sweet spot? Who do you work with? That's a great question. I mean, we really work with the entire industry. Where we got started was brokerage. So I will say that is our bread and butter and expertise. But where we're going is more on the shipper side because of what we talked about, because we can help people transition from one side to the other. And on the shipper side, it's just a bigger supply chain. Like you talked about, it's much more than just transportation. It's and really the dog. Getting... We're just the tail, fellas. Exactly. <laughs> so we're kind of moving into, yeah, we, we're moving into we're the- We're important, but we're not uh, as big as yeah. the dog. But anything that has to do with transportation, you know, manufacturing, procurement, distribution, the whole gamut is where we play. And we are working on roles of all levels, definitely specialize in more of those leadership positions, individuals that are moving from management into leadership. But if a client needed us to help with a independent contributor role, we're there for that too. Excellent. Excellent. So we talked a lot about the talent today. Now, can do, do you want people who are, you're obviously working for people who have jobs to offer. Do you also like it when people reach out and say, hey, hey I, I need a job, so I'm going to send my resume to CS? Of course. I mean, we want to help everyone we can. 
My message to those people is at the end of the day, it is a free service for candidates. So our clients, the hiring companies are the ones that are paying us to go find them the talent. So that has to be our first first order of business. So, so if and, I call, you're not saying, good, I got to find a job for Joe. You're like, no, I'll find a job for Joe if somebody wants someone with his exactly. skill sets. But, but, but I will say we're a different type of company in the sense that if I can refer you to someone or introduce you to someone that's going to help you, it's my pleasure. We can't help every... I mean, last year, Joe, we received 72,000 resumes came to our company, our, our small team of 40 people. <sighs> and you reviewed them all carefully. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So when you think of that, like it's very hard to respond to everyone and give them advice and point them in the right direction. We're going to take care of the people that we know have the experience that our clients are looking for. And that's kind of the the purpose of like the LinkedIn thought leadership is like, how else can I spread my advice in masses? So we do what we can. Yep. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about the Ladies Leadership Coalition. Yeah, happy to. So it's a group of women in this industry, myself, Nicole Glenn, who owns Candor. We've got Christy Knitchell, who runs Knitchell Logistics. We've got Blythe Brumlev, who many people know from her Just podcast. Saw her. Yeah, she's great. Sharon CR, who's down saw in her. Dallas. And then Liz Wayne. So we've got a group of women. All of us are very involved in the TIA, the CSCMP, and all doing different things in the industry. So it's refreshing. I mean, we get together to support each other, to work through each other's you know issues, wins, challenges. But then we also are doing a lot of interviews, bringing guests in for roundtable discussions, one-on-one podcasts. Our goal is to help more women share their stories. And that's exactly what we're doing. Yep. So I'll put a link to your podcast. And anything else you guys going to, you heading to any conferences coming up? We are. We. I'm actually going to TPM out in Long Beach next week, which is a, a maritime conference. And then I will be at the TIA for sure, probably FreightWave, CSCMP later in the year. We're doing ProMat in Chicago. So yeah, we've got a lot on our plate and probably- Any conference, you guys will be there. Yeah, there's probably 10 more that we want to be at. But next year, we will be at Manifest. We're going to move our retreat to another weekend so we can get there. Oh, yeah. I, I absolutely love Manifest. And I did see Blythe and I, I did see Christy. <laughs> Nicole Glenn could not make it. I think she had a plate. Those of us from the East Coast made it, but the people from the West, down, down South in Texas, they were close enough, but they didn't get there. But I, I really enjoyed Manifest. It was like drinking from a fire hose. But yeah. I have saw so many people that I've interviewed over the years and feels like a reunion, but I met so many new people. It was it was a whirlwind. I loved it. I had a lot of FOMO when I was looking at the <laughs> Yeah, we, you went to Mexico. Come on. <laughs> but I will say you are now the fourth person I've talked to that has gotten sick from Manifest. So I guess maybe a little bit of a blessing. I think the I'm only reason I got sick is because it was just well, I'm three hours time difference. I caught a cold, but I was in the on my last day there. I went to see Nelly on Thursday night. On Friday morning, I was checking out of the hotel. Somebody was on the phone. And goes, yeah, I don't feel good either. And I was like, oh, the whole damn hotel got sick. So Vegas had something going around. But anyway. Thank you so much for taking the time. I always enjoy talking to you. And this is only the first time I've talked to you on my podcast, but uh, we've talked it offline. And uh, it, yes, finally. And we will continue to. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yep. Appreciate it. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.